Hello, and welcome to the Paint Tacoma Beautiful Safety on the Worksite training. We're going to be going over best practices for safety on the worksite, and this presentation is required for all crew leads and site leads, and it's strongly encouraged for all other volunteers. Um, and the reason for that is just safety is a really important part of this program. We want to make sure that folks are um, using best practices on the work site and especially volunteering during COVID-19. We're going to be addressing some of the additional safety measures that we'll all need to take to reduce the spread of um, the virus. Um, we did have some technical difficulties when filming this presentation and so my wonderful face is going to be frozen each time another person is speaking so <laughs> if that's distracting to you you can just um, maybe take your window out of full screen and you can always hide my face behind another window or something like that or look at it if you know that makes this presentation more interesting so hope you have fun bear with us and um, we'll dive right in okay and so this is the uh, safety training so uh, you probably know me already I've been in touch with you all um, I'm the program outreach coordinator at Associated Ministries so I do most of the volunteer recruitment and outreach um, and then Amy and Brian are going to be introducing themselves in a second, but they'll slowly be taking on more of the volunteer management side of things and the technical side of things um, with Paint Tacoma Beautiful. Good morning, everyone. I'm Amy Allison. I know you both already. I'm Director of Community Mobilization here at Associated Ministries. So I oversee several programs that engage volunteers in service, and one of which is Paint Tacoma. And I started with Paint Tacoma in 2013, so I think this is my eighth summer. So welcome back to both of you. Great. All right, and Brian. Well, I'm Brian Nelson, and I'm the one person here whose sole job is Paint Tacoma Special. Paint Tacoma Beautiful. So I'm going to be the, the functional person for a lot of stuff in terms of paint supplies, technical issues, things like that. So. Uh, you don't want to keep my phone number handy, and my cell phone is perfectly all right for you to use uh, since we are all working from home right now for the most part. Uh, that's the surest, quickest way to get a hold of me anyway. So nice to meet y'all. Awesome. Great. And so um, today we're going to be going over safety as it relates to a few different topics. Um, First, we're gonna just go over a little bit of housekeeping in general um, with volunteering, and then we'll dive into safety as it relates to COVID-19, medical emergencies, immediate safety on the work site, uh, protecting your long-term health, children and youth, and lead paint. Um, since most of the volunteers on the call right now are returning volunteers, since you, if you've already taken the lead paint training in the past three years, um, I don't think you need to stay for the whole thing, although Amy and Brian and I might stick around to just have this recording available um, for other folks who couldn't make it today. All right, so. Um, although, um, yeah, Mary, Amy. let me just say something. I think uh, even if you're, if you're returning, we'd like everybody to sort of take the quiz. There's a short quiz yeah. at the end just to document that you, you're up to speed on the safety guidelines. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I am going to share a little bit about that quiz here in just a second. But um, if you, I think everyone on this call has applied online. But again, since we're recording this for other folks who couldn't be here, just as a friendly reminder to complete our volunteer application, it's pretty short. You can just complete the required field, which is like your name, date of birth, and all that. It's just helpful for us to be able to keep track of your contact information and your volunteer hours um, for tracking purposes. So um, when you finish, uh, we did create a short quiz. It's about, it's multiple choice. It's about 10 questions long. Um, and that's just a way for us, um, since we're doing all of this virtually and some people may wa be watching these recordings on their own time, we want to make sure that we are uh, conveying the information and it's being received and people understand it um, and are aware of, um, you know, the best practices um, for safety when volunteering with Paint Tacoma. So just a heads up, we'll be sending out a link to that training 
uh, after this uh, video goes out and um, and you can take that quiz and um, we're hoping for a 70% passing and um, that will make it a little bit easier for us to know kind of who took the training and who didn't. Yeah, the training is, the quiz is important too because it helps us keep tabs on who took the training for our EPA compliance on lead paint practices. So it is important. Yes. All right. So um, in terms of volunteering right now with COVID-19, overall Paint Tacoma Beautiful is a relatively low risk volunteer opportunity because it is going to be primarily outside. There's plenty of room around the house to have six feet distance from other folks. Um, but, you know, we still want to emphasize the importance of um, being using best practices on the work site because many of our homeowners are high in high risk categories. Um, and also we just don't know other, if other volunteers are high risk or live with people who are high risk. Um, so it's, it's easy to forget best practices. I know I went and visited my mom recently and we were supposed to be safe as six feet apart. And I just went right up to her cause I just forgot, you know, so we just really want to do our best to remind each other, um, to, you know, use those best practices, which we'll dive into here in a second for those reasons. Okay, on the job site, reducing the risk is really, uh, again, it's not a lot of new stuff, but it's stuff we need to be a little more careful about. Wearing face masks at all times. We're going to be providing face masks, and so not just while we're doing dusty things, but all the time. Um, maintaining six foot separation, that's not too tricky. We're usually not painting shoulder to shoulder on the side of the house. Uh, one new thing is sanitizing tools between users. So if you're handing off a tool to somebody else, it should get sprayed with the sanitizer, wiped down in between so that we're not carrying anything from person to person. The big deal is if we do have to enter the house of the homeowner, um, usually that's a question of restrooms. Uh, we want to make particular care that we're not carrying anything, either lead or bacteria, or viruses into the house. So leave your shoes outside. Make sure that you keep tabs on what surfaces you touch and sanitize those surfaces so that we're not carrying anything. The other thing that's recommended is not carpooling outside of families. Again, that's just a separation of space issue. Uh, so we will bring that to your attention as well. Great. Okay, so you all know that we do provide supplies to our volunteers. Um, so in addition to the traditional supplies of paint, you know, brushes and rollers and all of that, Paint Tacoma will provide every volunteer with a washable face mask. So we had um, somebody who sewed some for us and we have them in different sizes. So you'll just need to let us know how many you need, and if there's anybody who needs uh, a smaller or a larger than average size, um, how many of those you would need. We're also gonna provide, so that there'll be one per volunteer with the face mask. We'll also will provide each crew with uh, an eight ounce um, spray bottle of sanitizing spray for your hands and for tools, and um, one roll of paper towels. And that's so that you can go in the house and wipe down things with the spray and the paper towels. We do, as usual, we ask um, that you bring anything necessary for your personal safety and well-being, including your um, welcome and um, encouraged to bring extras of any of the above. Um, so just, um, and again, if anytime you need extras, as always, you can always contact us if you need something in addition to what we've already provided. Great. Uh, Brian, do you know if we have any questions so far about COVID-19 volunteering at this point? No, just Lloyd saying he's going to stick to the whole thing. Love it. So. <laughs> okay, great. All right. So in terms of medical emergencies, um, we do have a bit of paperwork that um, is involved with that is related to that. So um, all volunteers need to complete the emergency contact roster and the consent form with safety guidelines on it one time. And then each volunteer needs to complete their timesheet every single time they're volunteering on a site, right? So um, 
the emergency contact roster that is helpful for us to know um, who to contact, obviously, if there is a medical emergency and if there's anything specific we would need to communicate with EMTs. Um, and the consent form really just goes over all of our guidelines, confidentiality practices, um, everything that we would want volunteers to be aware of um, when volunteering uh, to stay safe and use best practices with our uh, homeowners. And then the uh, timesheet is important for a couple of reasons. The first is that we track volunteer hours through that timesheet. So that's helpful for us for funding purposes. And then it also helps to um, keep track of where you were and when in case there were any liability issues. If something happened to you, we would know exactly when you were on site. Uh, and then for the third reason, with COVID-19, if somebody were to contract COVID-19, it would also be a helpful tracking tool to know who they were in contact with. So in general, we just want to encourage anyone who's going to be a crew lead or a site lead to practice making sure that paperwork is something people are filling out every day. Um, you know, occasionally crews <coughs> may have new people coming in, um, different people volunteering on different days, and it's hard to keep track of who signed what. So I would just make it a general practice to ensure that, you know, just remind everyone every day that please sign the emergency contact roster, the consent form if you haven't done so already, and just sign in and out on that timesheet. Um, and then at the end of the project, all that paperwork will be returned to Paint Tacoma staff. And so, yeah. All right. Amy, I think this is yours. Yes. So, in a medical emergency, um, you want to call, not hesitate, um, and call 911 if there is a medical emergency. So, that would be things like injuries or heat stroke, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, you know, state serious bee stings or anything like that. You also, after calling 911, you want to contact the volunteers emergency contact person. And that is so that they can come to, uh, come to be with the person. Also to find out any information from that contact, um, that the paramedics may need to know. So any health conditions or anything like that, that the health, the paramedics need to be aware of. I'm not sure how I didn't get on that list, but the third place, as soon as you have time, after you've done the others, do please call either Amy or myself. Let us know what's going on. Thank you. Good point. We'll add that to the presentation for next time. <laughs> <coughs> All right. So immediate safety. When you're working on the work site, um, there can be different hazards. One of them is heat stroke or heat exhaustion. So in order to prevent this, we want to encourage folks to schedule work parties in the early morning or early evening, especially if you know it's going to be a hot day. Um, it's helpful to, you know, wear a sun hat, uh, sunscreen, loose clothing, and take uh, frequent water breaks. Um, and then I really like this uh this image here that kind of shows the difference between heat exhaustion or heat stroke. Um, so if you're experiencing any of these, or if you're a crew lead and you see your uh, crew members kind of showing, you know, uh, nausea or clammy skin, maybe they're feeling faint or dizzy, that's a really good time to encourage folks to either maybe go home or go into an air conditioned space, um, get some shade, get some water. Um, because if it does lead to heat stroke, um, which is any of those other symptoms there, nausea or vomiting, um, strong pulse, loss of consciousness, that's definitely a 911 emergency and you'll want to call them. So, all right. On the job site, we're always wanting to be aware of safety issues. Uh, one of the obvious one is wires. Um, sometimes we do see exposed wires like you see with the arrow there. As long as we're talking about encased wires that are designed to be exposed, like these typically called Romex wires, they can be exposed as long as there's no junction, open junction boxes or connections that are not enclosed within a junction box. So you can paint right over exposed wires like we see here. If you do see anything with exposed wires, exposed connections, open junction boxes, anything like that, that's definitely a warning sign we want to, we want to uh, stay clear of. 
and get the uh, homeowner or somebody else to take care of those before we're around those because that's a definite safety hazard. The other thing that's important is to talk to your homeowners. They live in the yards that you're going to be working on, and they know where the holes and the uneven spots are and the tripping hazards because I'm sure they found them all. Um, identify those and either mark them some way so they can be avoided or do something to mitigate those. The last thing we want to do is have people uh, tripping and falling, uh, having accidents that are uh, so easily avoided. All right, so we have a quick video to share with you about safety when using ladders. Um, and the way that we're sharing videos here is we are having you go down into the comment section of this video on YouTube. You might have to click a read more button and then follow the corresponding link to this video one. Um, the reason why we're doing sharing videos that way is because most uh, YouTube video makers um, get royalties from their videos based on the amount of clicks and advertisements that viewers watch and so the most respectful way to include other folks videos um, here is by having you click on them um, as an external link. Um, we also don't have the rights to those videos to include them inside this video so um, we'll just have you pause, put this one on pause, follow the link in the comment section, click on that and then um, meet us back here some of the links are only going to take you to a specific segment of the video so um, just watch what we've allocated for you and then you can meet us back here okay okay so uh, we also want to talk a little bit about safety with ladders and supplies um, i'm sure you all know this most of our ladders are a frame type ladders and um, for lower heights those are those tend to be pretty stable your body weight tends to stabilize them when you stand on it but when you need um, the taller ladders, the extension ladders, et cetera, for reaching those ha taller heights, um, you need to remember the four to one rule, which is for every four feet of height of the ladder, um, it should be at least one feet out from the wall. And a good way to tell if you've actually um, successfully have it at the right um, steepness is if you stand with your feet at the base of the ladder and you reach out your hands, if your hands can touch the wall, um, it's too steep and you need to spread it out a little bit further. Um, so uh, other issues with um, ladders with youth, if you have any youth on your crew, no one under 16 of eight, no one under 16 years of age is allowed on any ladder. And teens ages 16 to 17 are not allowed to work on ladders more than 10 feet off the ground. And that is Washington state law um, that makes that a requirement. Um, the other issue is making sure you keep your supplies out of the way. I have had times where I've seen volunteers step in um, trays of paint because they weren't out of the way. And then um, they both get their foot really messed up. They usually over end up overturning the tray of paint too. So it ends up on the sidewalk or on the grass. Um, so making sure we designate places for supplies, um, both while you're working um, so the people don't trip on it. And then afterward, um, usually the homeowner has a garage or shed where you can store things um, for the next project day or for the next crew if you're a one-day crew. All right. One of the things that's uh, always a job site risk is injuries, questions about back injuries and things like that. Um, you know, it's an old joke that says, doctor, it hurts when I do that. And the doctor says, don't do that. <laughs> That's, that really is an indicator. Pain, pain is a, uh, pain and discomfort is, should be telling you a message. Uh, do be very careful in your lifting techniques. Uh, if you've got heavy things, we deal in five gallon buckets of paint. Um, I'm very aware of that these days because uh, I'm dealing with a degenerative back and waiting for surgery. So. Uh, if I ask you to help come and load my truck or something like that, that's why. It's not that I'm lazy. So I can't lift. Um, but do stretching on the job site, making sure that you're uh, staying limber. Uh, take frequent breaks. Um, Want to have a good time. So be careful about uh, awkward positions and things like that. Particularly if you're on ladders and things, you don't want to be leaning away from ladders and things like that. Uh, those are accidents waiting to happen. And we just assume you come back as healthy and intact as you came onto the job site.
One of the things we may see, and I know we have several houses this year that include this, and that is asbestos siding. Uh, that is a concern for us, but we can work on it as long as it is intact. Uh, and because of that, when we're dealing with asbestos siding, it's often smooth, like you see in the pictures here. Uh, around here, tip, a lot of them have kind of a rippled bottom edge, kind of a wavy edge that makes it very distinctive. Um, some of the limitations we have, if there is damage to that siding, uh, hopefully I've we've eliminated that before it gets to you as a site leader, um, but occasionally there is damage or if damage happens during the job site, anytime we disrupted that asbestos, we need to stop clear away. While we are lead paint certified, we are not certified for asbestos. So uh, that's a danger. If it's intact, we can paint over it. What we can't do is scrape it, sand it, or pressure wash it. Um, you can wash asbestos siding with low pressure water like a garden hose and a, a brush, but uh, no aggressive anything on on uh, asbestos siding. The good news is that paint sticks like a son of a gun to asbestos siding, so rarely do we see questions of flaking and bubbling on asbestos siding. So we're hey, basically Brian. gonna coat right over it. May I ask a quick question? Yes. Are you, are you likely to see mold on asbestos siding or just dirt? Um, more often it's dirt. Occasionally you do see mold on the north sides, and that's a question of washing. And okay. uh, a weak bleach solution and a mop or a brush and a garden hose usually takes care of that. Okay, so you can use a bleach solution if there's mold on asbestos. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Know. Pressure washing or anything mechanical like scraping or all of the things that are out. So we'll come back to lead paint, but this is just kind of another um, topic that falls into that long term health. So we're going to spend a, a good chunk of time of our. Uh, to time together today on lead paint. So we'll come back to this in a few slides. So um, before we dive into more on lead paint, uh, I will just go over a few things in regards to children and youth. So when it comes to supervision for youth ages eight to 11, we have a one-to-one -one parent or guardian to child ratio. Um, and we just don't want children under the age of eight around any of our sites during the prep period. And the reason for that is because a lot of our homes may contain lead or asbestos or other toxic chemicals that are just not good for young children. Um, plus, especially with young children, I think that they just tend to have more fun painting rather than scraping or pressure washing. So um, we generally encourage groups if they're going to have really young children to only have them present during the painting portion of that project. For youth ages 12 to 14, we have a one to three adult to child ratio um, with parent permission. And then for high school groups, uh, we want at least one adult for all youth groups and at least two adults for groups of 10 or more. Yep, and uh, just reiterating, we talked about this in ladder safety, but it is a state workers protection law that no one under 16 years of age can be on any kind of a ladder. And those 16 and 17 should not be more than 10 feet off the ground. So just we want to reiterate that because that is state law and we're bound by that. We want to make sure that's absolutely clear. And this is a little bit of reiteration also, but during the prep stages, which both of you guys know is the removing old paint stage, um, and that's the time when you might there might be exposure to lead if it's in any, any of the old paint. No one who is pregnant or lactating should be on site and no children under age of eight on site during those phases. So if you are a returning volunteer and you've completed the lead paint portion of the safety training in the past three years, you are welcome to uh, stop the video now and um, just complete the quiz that we have sent out for you. Um, if you'd like to stay and just get a refresher, um, we always encourage that. 
Uh, if you haven't ever taken this training before, then please stay. Um, the quiz that we will send out, everyone needs to take it. So whether you're going to stay for this lead paint training or not, um, please do uh, complete the quiz. Um, anything that you may have forgotten in the past three years will probably come back to you when you start answering questions. Um, but you know, if you find that you're not able to get a 70% on that, then we just encourage you to come back and, and watch this part of the video. Um, and uh, take it again. Okay, here we go. Um, lead paint was very common in paint. It was outlawed and I believe finally completely outlawed in 1978. Uh, and it phased out in the, between the 1960 and 78. Um, the problem with us is that our houses, I did a quick math and the average age of our houses, as far as when they were built was 1928. And this year we have, the oldest house we have was built in 1894. So in all but about two or three houses on this year's uh, project list, uh, we have the potential for lead paint. Even when a house has been painted over several times, uh, the under layers of paint and the primers at the bottom almost always contain lead. So we do sort of make a predumptive presumptive assumption that there is lead paint and take lead precautions wherever we can. The problem with lead is that it's a very dangerous uh, toxin to the nervous system, especially to small children. And that's why we don't want children under age eight on the job site during prep periods. Uh, the dust gets, can get everywhere. We try to control it as best we can. And uh, just kids being around that uh, potentially for inhaling that dust or getting it on them. And uh, as far as discipline about touching faces and things like that, children just have a hard time with that. So it's best to keep them completely away while we're doing anything involving the lead removal. Um, yeah, the paints are often in just the most common way of uh, lead paint problems in older houses is children eating paint chips or chewing on windowsills. Obviously working outside, but uh, very toxic to uh, young children and developing um, fetuses for that's the pregnant folks. So that's why we use the precautions that we do. And this is all mandated by the uh, Environmental Protection Agency. So we're uh, pretty well bound by all this stuff. So how we address it, um, there is a five step process for addressing lead um, when you're on a work site. Uh, and we'll go through each of these steps one by one, but step one is to protect yourself and your crew. And I would also add your homeowner. Step two, set it up safely or containment. Step three, minimize dust. Step four, clean up and disposal. And step five, verify practices. <laughs> so step one, protect yourself and your crew. Um, so the first step is just to layer up. Um, your first layer should be old clothing. Your second layer should be safety glasses, gloves, shoe foot covers and face masks. Again, we'll be providing shoe covers and face masks. We don't typically provide um, work gloves and safety glasses. Uh, we ask crews to provide them themselves, but if for whatever reason you don't have that, we do have a few on hand in the office that we can provide for you. Um, there's also another layer if you happen to be pressure washing, and that's because you might be getting wet or most likely getting wet. So you may want to wear some rain gear. You also may want to wear um, something, some earplugs since the pressure washing can be kind of loud. Um, the second thing you want to do is make sure you're, you're um, using good protective practices. So number one is hand washing. All of us have learned a lot, I, I'm sure, um, in these past few months about good hand washing practices. Um, so that's something you want to employ after you've been doing prep work and before eating, drinking, or smoking. You want to, after the day is done, you want to remove and clean your shoes. So maybe just hose them down, the bottoms of your shoes. You want to wash your clothes that you wore and wash them separately from other clothing. And you want to sh take a shower. So again, you want to remove any um, lead dust that might have gotten in your clothing, your shoes, or yourself um, after your work. Break. And then um, protecting the homeowner, you want to make sure you keep windows and doors closed on the sides of the house during the prep work. Um, since you always need to make sure that the homeowner has one way, at least one way out of the house, make sure that at least you're not doing prep work on all four sides of the house. 
that there's always one side of the house that the homeowner can get out of at any time. Just one quick note also, uh, try to resist the urge of hugging your small children as soon as you get home from the job site. Mm -hmm. Stuff cleaned up first. They're the ones most vulnerable to lead, so we want to make sure we take every precaution to protect them. That's a good point. All right, we have a short video here on lead paint abatement um, that you can take a look at down in the comment section of this video. So if you wanna pause this, click on that, watch it, and then meet us back here, we'll continue on with the presentation. Thanks. Okay, containment is one of our biggest projects here. Uh, and how we do that is with layering plastic on the ground. The idea is to keep all the lead and potential lead chips and all paint chips in general in the containment area and disposed of. We don't want any in the garden or anything like that. So we're going to provide you with plastic and the plastic needs to go six inches up the wall of the house and we'll give you both masking tape and duct tape in order to accomplish that and then it needs to be 10 feet out from the house. Now, a lot of places you can do that straight out 10 feet, but we also run into odd vertical obstacles. So that 10 feet can be either horizontal or vertical. So if you look at this little model of the house here, on the left side, we'd run five feet across the ground and then another five feet up the fence. And one of the things you've got to be very cautious of in this kind of situation with pressure washing is there's potential to throw paint chips over that fence. So we want to be very cautious about that. Anytime you have plastic that, that has a joint, you want to overlap that joint six inches and secure it with tape. So we're trying to make a, a full containment area. Um, be very cautious, careful when you're using ladders on top of the containment plastic. It's easy to scoot a ladder and tear a hole in the plastic. If you have any kind of a hole, you want to patch that as soon as possible. And take care to lift ladders and uh, move them like that. Okay, um, so the next step is to minimize dust. And um, so basically, now that you've got everything set up, you do. we do not allow any of our um, Paint Tacoma volunteers to use any heat equipment, uh, such as heat guns or torches or mechanical sanding tools on the job, because those are very likely to generate dust. Um, and also do not scrape or sand any dry surfaces. Instead, use a spray bottle to lightly mist the paint surfaces you're gonna scrape or sand by hand. And that will make sure that you um, reduce the amount of dust that kind of flies up while you're doing the job. Disposal of, the, uh, of your material when you're done, uh, lead paint contaminated material is not considered a hazardous waste in terms of uh, garbage disposer, disposal. So when we're done with the drop cloth, uh, we'll roll it up with keeping the inside on the inside and the outside on the outside. So generally rolling from the outside to the center and then rolling it up uh, to contain all of that and securing it with duct tape. Uh, so that includes uh, anything with paint chips or anything. You can sweep up a drop cloth and collect them and then go, in, go into a garbage bag like this. Garbage bags need to be secured with a gooseneck tie. That means that you fill the bag no more than about two thirds full, twist the top, then fold over that twisted end and secure it with duct tape. That's duct tape, not just masking tape. Uh, and all cleaning, dusting of bodies and all that stuff should happen inside that containment area. So anything gets uh, included in that waste. Once it's bagged with a gooseneck tie, it can go into the household garbage. If your homeowner has space in the garbage, you can add it to their garbage bin. Uh, if you have excess material that the homeowner doesn't have space for, um, you can let us know, pile the extra garbage bags in an out of the way place. Um, where we can find them, let us know. We'll come by and pick them up and make a dump run. Uh, we don't want to burden the uh, homeowner with, with that. I think I would add a couple things about this. Um, one is that um, 
we do need to usually reuse our drop cloths. And so what you can do is sweep up the paint chips, miss the paint chips and sweep them up and dispose of them in the garbage bags. And then you can reuse the the drop cloths for the ne next day or the ne other side of the house. Um, at the end of the project, you should be in general disposing of the drop cloths altogether in the manner that um, Brian des uh, described. And um, with your tools, make sure that you swish them in um, a bucket of water to clean off and let them air dry to clean off anything, any paint chips or dust that's on the tools. The other thing is um, we do have a shop vac in the office. We only have the one. And if uh, for whatever reason, um, there's a lot of paint chips that have ended up on the ground, let us know because we can come by with the shop vac to try to clean that up. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I can't remember if it was mentioned in the portion about pressure washing with lead paint, but I noticed a note here about um, using cloth, drop cloths, or um, sheets instead of those plastic drop cloths to um, allow the water to pass through, but still collect those paint chips. Right. And the cloth yeah. sheets are also good for, uh, for draping over um, bushes and things like that, because mm -hmm. the plastic is kind of hard to get them over the bushes, and it can... Uh, you know, it can cause some damage, like heat damage to the to their foliage. So, one thing we also, when you, since you mentioned pressure washing, we always want to do all of our mechanical scraping before we pressure wash. Pressure washing is for removing dirt, not for removing paint. Um, if you've ever tried to pressure wash a house or a wall with chip paint and all, it goes everywhere. Containment is virtually impossible. So we want to do our scraping uh, first and the pressure washing second. Great. And does that, that applies for all houses, not just lead paint, would you say? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, and then um, the last step is to verify practices. And again, this is an EPA requirement. Um, there's a couple of different types of folks that are uh, involved in all of our projects. Number one are certified renovators. Um, and that includes Brian and myself. We have taken an eight hour um, lead certification class and passed uh, an exam. And our certification is good for five years. I think I'm two years into it and Brian is one year into it. Um, and so we are, are the overseers on your job because of that certification status. Um, there's also non-certified trained volunteers, which includes you all for having taken this training. And then, um, and your job is to make sure that you supervise and um, your crew members and ensure that they're following those safe practices that we've outlined today. And then your other crew members, their responsibility is to both sign our safety sheets, read and sign the safety sheets and to follow your instructions. Um, oh, I forgot to mention with the part of our job is the certified renovators and our oversight of your job is that we have to just check off that you have, um, that you're following safe practices. And so that can happen one of two ways. One is that when you are um, on your prep stages, if you want, uh, if you're able to call us and have us come by and take a look at it and go, yeah, it's good. The other way is you can do it by phone. Um, so you could sit there and, uh, you know, put your video, video function on your phone and give us a call and then just kind of show us this is how it's all set up. And then we can just say, yep, yeah, you're doing good. That's the way it should be set up. You're, you're good to go. Um, but we do need to, our goal, our job is to verify that, yes, you guys have um, followed those practices. I'm going to be around almost every Saturday and, uh, and all the time you're working. So don't think twice about calling me. And I'll try to drop by and visit most of the projects just to, with words of encouragement and what have you. And... Uh, Anytime you have any questions, any problems, lead paint, anything technically, equipment, anything, give me a call. Again, my cell phone rings in my pocket wherever I am. So uh, that's a good number to get a hold of me, especially in these days of working from home a lot. Uh, the office phones get checked periodically. Yep. Yeah, and if any of you have questions about uh, the volunteer program in general or want to give feedback about, you know, improvements we can make to the program, um, get in touch with me. I'm happy to hear that. We're, we're kind of making some, some small changes here at Paint Tacoma and having your input is always uh, really helpful. So, oh. 
<laughs> Don't forget to take the safety quiz when you finish this training. If, if there's any feedback you have about how this presentation was, again, this is the first online um, training we've done. And um, so any of your feedback is just most welcome. That about does it for our presentation. Thanks again to all of you for being able to take time out of your day to be here. And as always, we appreciate you so much for your dedication to this program. Thanks.